Good morning. Oh, sorry. I am a little bit frazzled today. I apologize, uh, but I'll get my wits about me probably about 1230. Um, so bear with me. I have a few announcements I want to let folks know about. If I forget one, remind me. <sighs> Number one, chili cook-off on the 4th. This coming week on Wednesday night, instead of Family Fellowship, traditionally is going to be our annual chili cook-off. Um, so in the past, people have won by popping the lid on a can of Nally's and putting it in a crock pot. If you choose to do that, that's fine. No one is going to judge you except in the judging. Um, but uh, if you have a wonderful recipe for chili, uh, by all means, uh, put it together, bring it, and we will enjoy that and then regret it later. So chili cook-off coming up this, uh, this coming Wednesday. We also have a couple of things that are on the calendar that I want to make sure that we're aware of. Uh, I'm going to say one, and then I'm going to invite... Some are up to do the other one. On the 15th, we have our annual crop walk. It's part of uh, what we do in cooperation with Church World Service. And so uh, the, oh, hi, Ann. Good to see you, dear. Oh, Ann has not been able to be with us for a long time, and it is a blessing to see you. And... If you want to sit on the edge, too, if you need to scoot out, by all means. So, uh, while they're settling it, Crop Walk is coming up on the 15th. Uh, there is also a youth uh, activity on the 15th as well, if you're interested in that. Those things are uh, announced on the bulletin board. We do take sponsorship to support Church World Service on that, but there may be another one that you want to support the day before, and I'll let Summer and Brittany come up and share a little bit about that. I'm doing a fundraiser for people who have people who have a mercy. Like me. Like me. Good job. So We're yeah. doing on October 4th. Um, 14th. The, the October 14th. What did I just say? Is that what I said? Hi. I don't know. October? Yes. <laughs> October 14th, we are Summer's Purple Monsters, and we're doing a walk. Um, for the Idaho Epilepsy Foundation, because in case you didn't know, she has epilepsy. Um, but Who are you? <laughs> you can um, walk with us if you'd like. We're doing a one-mile stroll, uh, so you can join Summer's I Purple. I love all the other time. <laughs> you can join Summer's Purple Monsters, or if you just want to donate to the good cause to help kids and adults like her that have epi epilepsy, it would be greatly appreciated. Okay, say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we, may, we may have kind of let something out of the bag there. That, so, uh, it's great. So, uh, on, the, on the 14th, Summer's Purple Monsters, uh, the, it, it's, it's the Epilepsy Foundation. Uh, so, uh, be considering supporting that. It would be a worthwhile cause and, and just to... Show your support of that and also the following. And, and I understand we're, we're doing... Hi. Thank you. I love your hugs. Um, uh, follow your heart. Give as the Lord uh, leads you to give. I'm sure that's not all the announcements, but I think it's time for us to start worship. And so I want to invite... Oh, District Conference. <laughs> District Conference is coming up. Oh my goodness, it's the same weekend. 13th and 14th for district conference, uh, so that, and that's here. So if you're interested in, in coming and sharing in that, I want to I invite you to do that. Oh, man, maybe we should all go to district conference and then go walk with Summer <laughs> and then come back for church on Sunday and then go walk with the crop walk. We'll all be together for a whole weekend. It'll be glorious. It'll be fantastic. So, yeah, a lot of things coming up. Do check uh, the website or the, uh, the, the bulletin or the bridge. Those all have those announcements posted in them. <sighs> I think that's it. I want to get out of the way. Mark, I think you're up today. Oh, nope. <laughs> hang on, hang on right there. So uh, 
we realized that we had an oversight in uh, presenting our Bibles to our young people um, because Nancy needs to have a Bible. And so I'd like to invite Nancy and, and Carol to come up. Nancy also had a birthday party the other day with delicious cake, and it was great. Yeah, come on up. So, Nancy, we would like to give you this Bible so that you can learn about Jesus, just like everyone else is doing here. And it has pictures and everything that you'd like to see in it, and we want you to wear it out if you could, okay? Here you go, dear. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mark, please. Ah, good morning and welcome. And if you're visiting, we hope you enjoy your time here and treat it as your church home for today. For, uh, to start with, I'm going to read Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God, that he has made us and we are his. Enter, and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his, faith, and his faithfulness to all generations. So anyway, it's, it's rainy outside, but it's good. Uh, I finished mint yesterday right before the rain started, so we're, we're in great shape. So, so if you will, uh, join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together and to sing your praises and to worship you. And open our hearts and minds that as we hear the words that we may understand, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, and for the uh, scripture reading today, it is Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then are we to say about these things? For, what then are we to say these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who... He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, he will not, will he not with him also give us everything? Who will bring any charge against him? God's elect. It is God who justifies, who is, con who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or per peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good morning. If you would all stand with me, we're going to start with, I will, or he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the For he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Can we do 
that one more time. I will, will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Now we're going to sing It Is Well With My Soul. It's 336 in the blue hymnal. For the offertory, I will be reading from Deut Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 through 17. Three times a year, all your mills shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the festival of the unleavened bread, at the festival 
of the weeks and the festival of the booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. All shall give as they are able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Now will you stand and please join me in singing the doxology. on the kids can make their way up uh, but I, I did forget an announcement so uh, Diane's out there she was supposed to remind me but she was out there so she couldn't remind me uh, for district conference we are inviting people uh, to bake cookies so if you have a phenomenal cookie recipe or if you have a marginal cookie recipe whatever it is if you get it off the back of the package whatever we would love to have cookies as many as you can have because for some reason, you, you, you never have too many cookies. So we're uh, soliciting folks to, to bake cookies and bring them, bring them to uh, the district conference or before we can, we can handle them to them. So if you have a good cookie recipe, please talk to Diane. Thank you. Hello. How are you guys? Good, good, good. Glad to hear it. Oh, boy. Summer's going out there. Sometimes that happens. So uh, not too long ago, some folks in the congregation... Amos and Rosa, who are right over here, can you see them? They went fishing. And while they were there, because they know I like rocks, they picked up some rocks and they brought some rocks back for me. And I have one right here that they brought. And I, this was the first one I looked at because it caught my eye. And I thought, well, if they were fishing on a river and they found a rock like this, I would automatically think that that's just like algae on there, right? But it's not. It's in the rock. Check this out. See how pretty that is? And it doesn't wash off. It's really bright green. And then around it is kind of clear a little bit. Nancy, can you see this? Yeah. That's pretty neat. Leaves inside of rocks like that. And, and Charles back here, he said that that might be malachite, which I think is probably right. I'm not super well-versed on rocks, but malachite's a green mineral that forms inside of other minerals. And so that's, that could be what it is, but it was so pretty. And you know what? If you look at the outside of it, do you think you could see what's in there? You think you can? Oh, because you know what's in there. But if you looked at that, would you think that there was something pretty and green inside? Maybe. Oh, you're... <laughs> because there is something pretty inside. Now, you know what? That's kind of like people. People don't always show us what's inside. And you know what? Sometimes the outside's a little bit rough and a little bit worn and a little bit uh, maybe not as pretty as it could be. But you know what? On the inside, because God loves us so much, each person is very, very special. You know what? The fact that God loves us makes us beautiful inside. 
Now, we don't always live up to that, and we should work on that. That's what we learn, and we grow into that. But God's love inside us is a beautiful thing that we don't always see on the outside. But we can show it, so let's work on that. Let's show, work on showing people the beauty that's inside us. God's love, okay? Makes pretty good sense. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the reminder in your creation of how much you love us and how sometimes you've hidden beautiful things inside of us. And Lord, we don't always recognize it. We don't always see it in other people. And sometimes we don't even see it in ourselves. But the fact that you love us makes us so precious and so special. And we thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go on down. I'm going to ask you to stand one more time. We're going to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's 521 in the blue hymnal. Seek ye first, which is on 324. So I want to invite you to, if, if you are comfortable flipping back and forth between passages, just have that Romans 8 passage that Mark read. That's a, oh man. They say you shouldn't have favorites. Can't help it. It's one of my favorites. So that Romans 8 passage, have that in your mind as we look at this passage from Acts chapter 5. This is a, a paragraph, a section out of the latter part of that chapter. We looked at the earlier part of it last week. But here, uh, when they heard this, talking about the ruling council, they were enraged and wanted to kill them, referring to the apostles. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, 
a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. And then he said to them, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan, pay attention to this part, if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. A big part of my thinking recently has been focused on cultural change. I think of other things too. That's not the only thing on my mind. I think about getting the chimney cleaned and I think about you know, fixing the lights and the pickup and encouraging Cyrus to get his homework done. So there's more going on here. But the class I'm currently taking, uh, we're talking about this idea of implementing change, systemic change, structural change. And there's no bigger potential for positive change than in the culture. In basic terms, the question is this, how do we get this mess of a society moving in a positive direction? Now, one of the authors that we've been examining, his name is James Davison Hunter, he proposes that the ways that we've been going about it aren't really that effective, at least not as effective as we think that they are. And he's talking primarily about politics here. While he's not saying that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics in a way that's appropriate, what he is saying is that putting all of our cultural change eggs into a political basket, it's not the best idea. To use that fixing the pickup metaphor, when you want to get your truck running and heading down the road in the right direction, getting a new seat cover really isn't going to accomplish that much. What we're after as believers, as followers of Jesus, is moral and ethical at its root. We want the values to reflect Christian values in our society. And if we know anything about politics, then we know that they aren't always focused on the moral or the ethical. Morally, hopefully, morality, it shapes legislation. It, it, it gives it a, a shape in the process, but politics aren't really about morality or ethics, the political process is about power. Now, I'm not totally on board with this author, uh, James Davison Hunter, but I do think that he is on to something here. We need to understand something about the way that the world works. What is good and what is right, those are important questions to ask. I think probably there is no more important question. But so much of what happens in the world, so much of what goes on culturally, it's not about what is good and right. It's about who has power and who can use it. And while politicians may use the language of morality, claiming that they'll stand up for what is good and what is right, they're really more concerned about getting their hands on the wheel and having power. Sure, now once they have that power, they, they may try to do something good and right. But in this system, the good and the right are secondary outcomes, subordinate to the accumulation of power. Now, I'm not trying to be cynical here, even though there might be a little cynicism creeping in there. But this is it's helpful for us to understand how the system works. It shines a little light on our story today. Because in this story, we've got characters who are clearly more concerned about power than they are about what is good and right. And we've got a clear indication also of what God's priorities are. And finally, we're presented with a choice. Now, last week, we looked at that terrible story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, oh boy, that's a rough one. 
Got to go through it, though. We looked at the way that they tried to deceive the Spirit of God, and we saw pretty clearly the consequences of deception. For Ananias and Sapphira, it was death. Integrity is important. We need to hold on to it. It is still important. So right there, we've already got something about God's priorities, what God is, is concerned about and what he thinks is important, and the, and the way that God's priorities, that God's reign runs up against the established cultural patterns of power and control. That system that they lived in of honor and shame, it was so prevalent in the first century, it didn't matter whether you told the truth, it just mattered if you had the honor. However you get it, doesn't matter. So now Luke is taking us forward in the story, and we see that in spite of this very frightening thing that happens in that church, that the community is starting to thrive. It's starting, people are responding to it. There's a lot of wonder, and there's a lot of awe. People are, are, are just... They're struck by this. Signs are being performed. Miracles are happening. The people are enthralled. They even bring their sick and their lame and they set them along the path that they know that the apostles are going to travel just to have Peter's shadow come over the top of them and hopefully heal them. This is what's going on. They're, they're coming from all over just for that tiny little hope of restoration. And throughout it all, the apostles are consistent. They are telling people about Jesus. Now, if you remember a little while back, earlier in Acts, we looked at another story of healing. There was this man who had been born lame and he'd been placed there daily by the, by the beautiful gate in the temple and he was begging for alms and the, the Spirit heals him through the words of Peter and John. And that gets the apostles in trouble because it stirs up a ruckus there in the temple precincts. Uh, the ruling council Call, calls them in, hauls them before the, the, the gathered body and questions them. But there's no charge against them. We learn that. They didn't do anything wrong. And, and, and so the council has to let them go. But it's not before they command them to stop talking about Jesus. And Peter and John, you remember, they say, well, <laughs> I don't know. If we're in trouble because we healed somebody. I don't know what to make of that. But, you know... <sighs> We're going to tell you we got a choice. We can either obey you when you tell us to stop talking about Jesus, or we can obey God, who compels us to talk about Jesus. And frankly, we choose God. We just can't help it. We've got to talk about Jesus. And so that's the setup for the, the story today. That's the background. And it's this tension between the ruling council and this other group, these apostles, who are, who are having so much of an influence. So if you've got Acts 5 in front of you, open there, look at verse 17. In verse 17 of the chapter, the high priests, along with the Sadducees, they decide, we're going to do something about this. It's getting out of hand. So we need to take this and, and, and do something. And you've got to remember who the Sadducees are. The Sadducees are the, the ones that are more concerned about the claim that Jesus was raised from the dead, the resurrection of Jesus, than they're concerned about the accusation that they killed the Messiah. And you think about this for a second, that's a perfect illustration of the priority of power. The Sadducees, if they were concerned about what was right and good, they might have tried to maybe uh, clear their names of that accusation, uh, killing the Messiah, maybe repent and seek forgiveness if they, if they accepted it, but that's not their concern at all. Their concern is how they can keep power, and as the crowds slip away from their doctrinal foundation that there is no resurrection they don't want to lose that power. They don't want to lose that control. That's their primary concern. And we get a lot more of that here in the, in the passage today. They choose to take action. They want to do something, not because they think the apostles are wrong morally or ethically, but because they're losing power. People aren't paying as much attention to them. Now, there may have been some ethical considerations, but we've already established that the the ruling council accepts that, yeah, what they did with this miracle was right. God had to be in it, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. So we're not dealing with a moral problem here, that the, the apostles are immoral and we need to fix it. Their beef is, a, is about control. They're jealous of the influence that the apostles seem to have. And so they grab them <laughs> and they throw them in jail. And again, first, first century jail was just a place you waited for trial. And so they're waiting there in jail overnight. They're going to bring them out in the morning. 
And uh, what really needs to be done, the council understands this, is that they need to, uh, these upstart Galileans, they need to be taken down a notch publicly. We need to undermine their authority. It's a political solution because this is about power. They need to be discredited. They need to be humiliated. And so the crowds will shift their allegiance back to us. That's their, their goal. So let's hold them overnight. We'll bring them out for a public shaming uh, in the morning. And uh, uh, that will reestablish our power. But this is the great part of the story. They go to the jail. They look in the jail. And the doors are all locked. And they, they open them up. And they look inside. And there's nobody there miraculously, they've disappeared. They're no longer being held in these cells. And they're sitting there, the, the, the guards come back, they're like, we can't find them anywhere. And the guards come back, and while they're trying to figure that out, another group comes in and goes, hey, you know those guys that you put in prison last night? They're out in the temple courtyards talking about Jesus again. It's great, I love it. It's like a, it's like a, a slapstick comedy going on in the ruling council here. So they say, all right, we'll go out, we'll get these guys, we'll, we'll, we'll send a guard out. They bring the apostles in, and they start with the finger wagging. Didn't we tell you? Did not, were we not clear when we said, stop talking about Jesus? Stop using the name of Jesus. We sternly warned you. As if that would make a difference. Peter and the rest of them, they probably rolled their eyes at that and, and said, yeah, 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 we remember what you said. Do you remember what we said? We said, pretty clearly, quite explicitly, we have to obey God and not human authority. You see, you're not in charge here. We answer to a higher power. Now, think about this for a second. If you want to get somebody who is completely infatuated with power to literally lose their minds, this is how you do it. You just say, you know what, you don't have any power. <laughs> Questioning their legitimacy, their, their, their control, their right to rule, that is a surefire way to drive them nuts. And it's exactly what we see here. Verse 33, the first one that we, we started with from our reading. When they heard this, and what they heard was this very thing. You don't have any power here. We don't answer to your authority. When they heard this, they were enraged. And they wanted to kill them. Now, I don't know how much of this to take seriously. I mean, there could be a little political grandstanding here. A little bit of feigned uh, outrage, which we see a lot of these days. But I not going to try to read too much into the story. Luke simply wants to tell us that they were mad. They were upset and mad enough to, to start agitating for an execution. Now in that council chamber, fortunately, there were some cooler heads, some people who were not enraged, a few people who were more concerned about what was good and right than they were about power. There was a Pharisee there, and don't miss that this is a Pharisee that we're talking about, the occasional opponent of Jesus and the consistent opponent of the Sadducees. There was a Pharisee named Gamaliel. And Gamaliel stands up, and he's going to say a word or two. I love this guy. He's a great, great figure. Such a rich detail that Luke gives us here. It, it shows us we're not really dealing with the, a cut-and-dried good guys and bad guys kind of story here. God's active throughout all of this, in all of the characters. It's just that not all the characters are as responsive to God as Gamaliel is. Anyway, Gamaliel, and this is the, probably the mentor and the teacher of Paul, the Apostle Paul. Gamaliel stands up, and after sending the apostles out of the room, he, he lays down some wisdom. Again, here's someone who is prioritizing what is good and right, the morality, over power. Listen, guys, he says, you need to hang on for a moment. Let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Think about what it is that you're considering. Now, we've had all kinds of these popular uprisings, these movements. They've been around us. It's like we get one new one once a week. A while back, it was Thutis. That, he, he, he thought he was something. He claimed to be somebody. A bunch of people followed along behind him. 
But then when he was executed, when he was killed, everybody split up, they dispersed, they disappeared. And then a little bit later, it was exactly the same thing with Judas the Galilean. He died, his followers were scattered. And what Gamaliel's telling them, it, it seems, you know, this is wise, this is pragmatic. It, it, it's like that uh, real politic, that, the pragmatic way that our power brokers uh, use a function in our system. He seems to be implying that, hey, we don't really have to do anything here. We'll just wait it out. Let's be patient. And this thing's going to go away. The waves will crash against the establishment, and they'll just disperse, uh, just like all the others. We could think that, but I don't think that's what Gamaliel's getting at. I suspect that the words of the apostles were still humming in his ears when they said that they have to serve God and not human authority. I think he took that to heart. So he goes on. He says, I think we should just let this play out. Let's just let it go its, its route. And, and, and this is the key moral and ethical point. If the plan is of human origin, if it is something that humans have cooked up on their own, if it's based in human authority, this is what he says, it will fail. Inevitably. But, if God's behind it, if this is of God, then, then nothing that humans can do, no human institution can do anything to stop it. Do you catch that? That's something. Do you want to be fighting against God here, he says? We need to unpack this a little bit because this is the most... One of the most profound statements about power and authority and God's sovereignty that you're ever going to run across. The truth behind Gamaliel's statement is this. Everything that happens in the world happens under the authority of someone or something. There's someone behind everything. There is power that is being exercised. Movement in the world, movement in culture, all of it is an act of power. Those with power use it. You want an example of this? I can give you one. Just look at the last minute shenanigans of this whole budget thing and the shutdown that was narrowly averted. I had to actually change my sermon because I wrote it and then they fixed it. And then I don't even know if it's fixed. But at any rate, this is power at play. There's no hiding it. We don't need to go into ideologies or convictions or what's right or wrong or the morality of it. It's simply an example of power at work moving things. And in some cases, stopping movement. As, you know, this is, there's power at play there as well. You can see morality might be behind these things or not, but it's the power that, that takes action and does things. Back to this James Davison Hunter. Hunter says that, that Christians who are lining up behind one political power or another, and he points out to extensive examples on both the right and the left of the aisle, they do more to advance the power of those parties than they do to advance any moral Christian agenda. It's not their intent. These are well-meaning believers. They really want to inject some Christian morality into the current amoral mess. And there's always a hope a hope there that in doing that, that that we can do that but the system isn't interested in that the system is only interested in power not morality i mean look at this from gamaliel's point of view in many ways the culture it's it's a human thing it is something of human origin it's evident in the popular culture of the media television movies music art it's evident in every government that around the globe. It's evident in education. It's evident in the economy. Human origin, human design under human authority. And I want to be clear. It is absolutely possible to have human institutions that are deeply influenced by God. The church as an institution is one of those things. There could be tons of spiritual and moral weight that shapes what is, in essence, a human creation. God is not absent from any of that, from anything that humans put their hands to. This very story proves to us that God is present, both in the apostles and in the ruling council. 
But what's at stake here isn't whether a human institution can be good and right or whether God can be present and influencing the actions of human. The answer to both of those questions is absolutely yes. God is there and they can be good and right. But that's part of our problem. You see, because we settle for God's influence over things when we really need to accept God's sovereignty, his rule over things. You see, the way the world works, the divisions of power in the world, particularly in America, they're they're often framed as conflicts between one side and another, between conservative and liberal, between Republican and Democrat, between urban and rural, or black and white, or rich and poor, or men or women. The power conflicts and the tensions and the struggle, it is all between human combatants. But what Gamaliel is trying to get us to see here is that there is another battle happening. There is another fight happening, a more profound struggle over power. It's between the principalities and the powers of this world and God. God is on one side, and the things that are empowered by the powers of this world are on the other side. The ruling council was looking at this whole situation in the same way that we have a tendency to look at things. If this other group gets power, that means that I lose power. There's a scale happening here, a a balance, and I can't, I won't be able to have the control that I once enjoyed if they get more power. It's what's behind their jealousy and their rage of the council, the the bloodlust. It's a loss of power. But thank God for Gamaliel quietly, wisely reminding us that there is a far more significant and profound power dynamic at play. You see, these principalities and these powers, the forces that are aligned against God in the world, they would like us to forget, to lose sight. They toss up a smokescreen. They obscure the truth. They get us thinking that the only choice that we have is between one evil or another. Choosing between one faction or another, choosing one party or another, line up behind one Messiah figure or the other. They get us thinking that our only choice, the only choice is, for, is to support one play for power or this one, to help them strengthen their grip or their opponents. You see, they don't want somebody like Gamaliel stepping in and pointing out that, you know what, all this, these are undertakings of human origin and ultimately doomed to failure. Every single one. They don't want us to realize that the only authentic choice, the only real choice that we have is to choose to obey God or to obey human authority. That's the dichotomy. That's the choice that we have to make. It's not about picking the best human authority to follow, although that may be important. It's a matter of choosing human or God. About submitting to God's sovereignty and his loving authority. It's about making God's plans our plans. Because, as this wise man tells us, only God's plans succeed. These are the only things that cannot be overthrown. Now, what we're talking about here, it's a disposition of the heart. It's something that goes on inside us. It's letting our devotion to God inside of us be our guiding principle outside of us. Choosing to obey God instead of human authority, it's not to step outside of the culture because we can't do that anyway. We are in it whether we like it or not. It's like just part of the air that we breathe. We don't opt out of the process. Culture of all kinds, political, social, economic, popular, whatever culture it is, all of those desperately need moral and ethical Christians who will engage in that culture. It needs faithful believers who by their faithful presence will leaven the whole loaf, who will be the salt and be the light. And our total devotion to God will lead us there because that is exactly where God is, redeeming that, working 
even now. But when we get there, we will be under the authority of God, not under human authority. And when the principalities and the powers try to pressure us into acting against the will of God, acting out of jealousy or rage or fear instead of love and compassion, then, then we need to remember the words of this wise man, Gamaliel. After all, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we want to be found fighting against God, do we? Today we're going to share in communion. And I want to, it mean, communion means many different things, all of them rich. But today I want to invite you to think about how sharing in communion can mean a recommitment to God's sovereignty, recognizing God as Lord of our lives and ruler in our hearts. We'll take a moment to just reflect, to, to have that time of quiet prayer to get our hearts ready. It's a chance for us to do that. And again, this is the Lord's table. If you are a believer and you want to come, the, Jesus says you are more than welcome. And so we'll share in this together. But we want to do it with a ready heart. So we'll take some time, some silence, and then I'll close that time in prayer. If you would bow with me. Lord, we've taken a turn in our service today from thinking about things like power and authority and who's in charge in our lives. We've turned to this table, a table that reminds us of Christ's sacrifice, of the willingness of your son to have his body broken and his blood shed. That redeeming power is worth something. It's worth all of who we are. And so we are reminded again of how much you love us and how precious it is to belong to you. Lord, you are for us as Paul writes to the Romans and we want to be for you we pray these things in Christ's name Amen as the followers of Jesus reclined around the table Jesus took a piece of bread He held it, and then he blessed it, and he broke it. I want you all to eat this, he said. This is my body. We will share the bread. I ask that you hold on to it until we can bless it together and then take it together.
you would join me in this prayer. God of infinite love, we hold in our hands the reminder of your son's body, which was broken for us. We remind not only of the pain Jesus endured, but of the way our souls are nourished by your sacrificing love. The bread reminds us of both our complicity and your forgiveness. We ask that you would bless this bread as we thank you for the bread of life. We pray in the name of the one who allowed his body to be broken. Amen. The bread, the body of Christ, broken for us. Let us take it together. After sharing the bread, Jesus took a cup and he said to his followers, I want you all to drink this. It is my blood, the covenant blood, that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Join me in this prayer. Lord, who brings life from death, we hold this cup filled with the reminder of the blood of Jesus, blood he was willing to pour out for many so that forgiveness can become a reality. The cup reminds us of the cost of redemption, a price you were willing to pay. We ask that you would bless this cup and help us not to hold cheaply something which cost you so much. We pray in the name of the one who laid down his life so that we might live. Amen. The cup, the blood of Christ, poured out for us. Let us take it together. You would join me in this final prayer. Loving Father, like the first followers of Jesus, we have shared in bread and in cup. 
We have been reminded again of the sacrifice of your son, and we have been renewed in our commitment to you. This holy meal has restored us and equipped us for your service. We have felt your love and are now more ready to show it. Lead us again from this table into the world so that we may love as we have been loved. We give you the praise and the honor, for you are worthy. And we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Seeky first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Ask and it shall. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Oh, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may go in peace.